before we can take our story further about how it is we get glucose into the cell, we have to pause for just a moment and talk about protein structure because many of the players, insulin, a glucose transport protein, and the insulin receptor, all of those things are proteins. So let's look at some protein structure. Amino acids are the monomers, see up here in the left-hand corner, of proteins. The monomers, the amino acids, of which there are 20, are connected together by covalent bonds. In particular, we, we have a name for that type of covalent bond. It's called a peptide bond. And before we talk about the bond itself, let's look at the structure of an amino acid. They all have basically this structure. What they have in common is what is not included in this little red ring. So they all have an acid portion. This portion right here, that's an acid functional group in organic chemistry. Here is the amino functional group. And all amino acids have a hydrogen in this position what they have in the position where this circle is, is a variable. In, in organic chemistry, you would find an R in that place. And the smallest group that could be where that R is, is a single hydrogen atom, which I have here. If there is a hydrogen here, we have the smallest amino acid, that is glycine. The largest of the amino acids is tryptophan. And the R group, in this particular case, is circled as well as I could circle it with this red circle. So here's the acid group. Oxygen, remember, are the red balls. And here's the amino group. Nitrogen is blue. And so each of those, remember, would be a hydrogen. So tryptophan is quite a bit larger than glycine. Now back to the peptide bond. The way the peptide bond is formed is using a process called dehydration. And it's called dehydration because what you do is you take one of these hydrogen away from the amino group of one amino acid and the OH group off of the acid group of another amino acid. And of course, that gives you water H2O, and it leaves you with a bond between the nitrogen atom here and the carbon atom here. We don't need to draw the bond or any of that stuff. So forming it requires dehydration, forming the peptide bond. Breaking the peptide bond breaking, requires hydrolysis. You just put the H and the OH back and you're left with a broken bond. Protein structure is described as having four basic levels. The primary structure is simply the sequence of the amino acids. That is encoded by the gene. The reason it's important is because that variable R of the different amino acids, remember there are 20, sometimes it's positively charged. Sometimes it's negatively charged. Sometimes it's polar. Sometimes it's nonpolar. And so all of these things will cause these amino acids in the primary structure to arrange themselves in a favorable way. And it's all about energy, of course. So they arrange themselves in the most energetically favorable way. And in doing so, they form what we call secondary structure. One of the types of secondary structure is, doesn't that look like a spring to you? It's called a helix. Here's one where the protein sort of folds back on itself like the pleated fans you made when you were in kindergarten. Those are secondary structures. They're sort of like small neighborhoods of the larger protein. Tertiary structure, which is way over here in my figure, tertiary structure is what you get when all of those neighborhoods align themselves in a way to form the entire polypeptide. Now, 
I know that I've told you that we generally call things polypeptides if they're smaller than 100 or so amino acids. We call them polypeptides in this context regardless of their size. And the reason we do that is because there are cases where there is another level of structure. It's called quaternary structure where several, in this particular case, four polypeptide chains come together to form the functional molecule. It can be more than four. This looks an awful lot like hemoglobin to me. Hemoglobin. It has four polypeptide chains, and I don't know if you can make out the color here, this little, let me get a lighter color. There's this, this sort of gray disc, and there's another one down here. It looks a lot like the heme group in protein. It's where, sorry, the heme group in the hemoglobin protein. It's where oxygen would bind. So I suspect that's what this is depicting. That's the quaternary structure, the fully functional protein we call hemoglobin. I found this on the web, and it was so cool, I just had to show it to you. I had to do some modifications, some copying and pasting to get it to fit on my slide, but I couldn't resist. It shows you a great many different proteins, which is really helpful, I think, to show you that proteins are vastly different, not only in their size, but in their function. So for example, way down here in the corner, this is insulin. Do you see that little green speck? Um, insect flight muscles. How cool is that? If you look way over here, you see the contractile proteins that we'll talk about later in the semester <clears throat> in our own muscles. And here are two oxygen binding proteins. Hemoglobin, the slightly larger one that we just saw the quaternary structure for, and here is myoglobin, a protein that you find in muscle. Here is a digestive enzyme that we find in our small intestine, and look at this. This is the most abundant protein on the most abundant enzyme on earth. It is the enzyme that plants use to capture CO2 from the atmosphere. It's called carbon fixation. We can't do that. We need more plants. Rhodopsin, this is one of the pigment proteins on the retina of our eye. We just could go on and on, couldn't we? They are just so cool. Oh, ribosomes. Gotta have those. <clears throat> Antibodies. So I like that this shows you different size. It shows you different roles. Look, these are, here is a protein that's part of a virus. See down here? More than one protein, obviously, is part of the coat for this virus. Just a cool slide. I just like it. There probably is no more single concept in physiology that is more important to understand than how it is certain things can cross a plasma membrane. And this little box here, which also appears over here, is abbreviated GLUT4 in particular, and it is a glucose transport oops, protein. So maybe you remember from high school biology that there's something called simple diffusion. That's what these guys here are doing under their own power, following concentration gradients, because they're small and nonpolar molecules, they can cross the membrane at will. Larger molecules like glucose require facilitated diffusion. Now, this to me is a fascinating story because this molecule here, which I've drawn just as a, a box, the glucose transport protein, isn't normally on the surface of the cell. Normally, it's sequestered, follow the dotted line back. Normally, it's sequestered in, what's this number for? It's a vesicle. 
So GLUT is a transmembrane protein, I need something lighter there, don't I, that spans the membrane of this transport vesicle. And as we'll see shortly, whenever insulin arrives, this transport vesicle will travel to the plasma membrane, and when it fuses with the plasma membrane, suddenly GLUT, there's my little transport protein, is inserted into the plasma membrane. So for the purposes of size, remember, that's all we're doing here, let's look at what GLUT looks like. This is a very complicated figure. We're just going to look at it briefly to make a few conclusions from it. First of all, what looks like a ball here, each of these little circles, that's an amino acid in this figure. And this is, this happens to be a glucose transport protein that is from a bacteria. And frequently what a molecular or cell biologist will do in trying to, to learn how a, a protein works is they'll compare the sequence, the primary, remember, sequence, primary structure of the amino acid across several species. And when they use words like invariant or conserved residues, residue just means amino acid, that means they're really important amino acids to the function of the protein. They are conserved across all different species that are studied. And so these are the ones that are in, what is that? Is that magenta, green, dark green? So those are really, really important amino acids. Now this, this figure here is what we call a ribbon figure, and you can see the spiral, can't you? Like we've got these uh, spring-like regions. This figure down here, which is B, matches wherever B is up there, here it is, um, shows us the amino acid sequence as a computer predicts and each of these little squared portions here is a part of this protein that spans across the plasma membrane. So there should be, this is not one by the way, but these that are all in a plane like this, there are like 12 of them, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 10, yeah, 12, we call them membrane spanning domains. And look what else they tell you that's pretty cool. Um, if you look at the ones that are in red and yellow, they're the ones that are important in glucose binding. So we have these great big, these are, these are hanging out in the intracellular side. This is the extracellular side. So these are really important in recognizing glucose. Here, too, is something really interesting. There's something called a GLUT1. Some people are born with deficiencies of this protein. That happens to be because of mutations here, or you see these little blue circles. Those are the amino acids that are responsible for that deficiency. Here are more of the red and yellow ones. So these are membrane-spanning portions of this protein. Now, if you were to look down on the membrane, the protein probably looks sort of like this, a core in the middle, because glucose has to go through it. Those red and blue balls are going to be things that glucose has to interact with as it's grabbed from one side of the membrane and pulled across to the other side.